let's get one thing straight. Materialism doesn't mean materialistic, and idealism doesn't mean idealistic. Totally separate contexts. In a philosophical context, materialism doesn't mean is overly concerned with wealth and objects, and idealism doesn't mean naively pursuing your fantasy. They are metaphysical statements, okay? I don't want to see anyone on the internet ever mix that up ever again. Okay, see you in the next one. What? What? I have to do the whole video? No. No, I just... I just wanted to... No, I know, but people... Ready to rock, rock, rock. Okay, I, I, I mean, I guess I should tell you what the words actually mean then, right? Okay, so we could start in ancient Greece where people like Anaxagoras said that nous or mind is what controls and orders the world, or Democritus that what is is made out of an infinite number of tiny oasei or substances. But I'd rather skip all this to be totally honest because the pre-Socratic philosophers are a video all on their own. We are instead going to start in France with this nerd, René Descartes, widely considered the founder of modern philosophy. Let's set the scene up a little bit. We're going to imagine this nerd sitting in a little house with a ball of wax and a stove, and somehow he is about to dunk on all of Western philosophy. So what Descartes does here in the meditations, he starts with radical doubt. He's basically going to say that he's noticed that as his life passes, as he's gotten older, he's come to find more and more of the things that he thought were true ended up being false. So in order to root out all these things that he is wrong about, he's going to chuck out every belief he possibly can through this process of radical doubt. As he puts it, I needed just once in my life to demolish everything completely and start again from the foundation. Everything which has been previously assumed, he's going to put to the test. He starts to lay out all the ways he can doubt reality. The senses can deceive you, you don't know whether you're dreaming or awake, there could be an evil demon controlling and, and conspiring to create a false reality around you that isn't true. These things, they seem kind of obvious almost, almost like childish, but the point isn't to assume something new, like an evil demon which controls us, but instead, sort of like in a court of law, it raises reasonable doubt to reality itself. We cannot verify that the world out there is true, and so it cannot be our foundation. So we've taken away reality. Uh, our senses are out the window, they can be doubted away. Physical reality, really, stuff out there, that's out the window. Even your own body, you know, your hands and feet, whatever, that's all physical substance that can be doubted away. That could be a, a, an illusion from the evil demon as well. But even when we've doubted away everything, even our own body, there still remains something which cannot be doubted. And that is the something which was doubting in the first place. As Descartes puts it, even then, if the cunning deceiver is deceiving me, I undoubtedly exist. Let him deceive me all he can. He will never bring it about that I am nothing while I think I am something. So this is what you've most obviously heard summed up as, I think therefore I am. But it's a little bit reductive, that formulation, as it ends up really being something closer to, in practice, I doubt, therefore there is something there to do the doubting, something which doubts. The only thing that you can't doubt away is that something is doubting. And this is where Descartes draws the line between body and soul, sometimes translated as mind. The I, the subject, the soul, the mind, whatever you want to call it, uh, it is which by this process of doubt must be fundamentally different than the body. He says, by a body I understand whatever has a definite shape and position and can occupy a region of space in such a way as to keep every other body out of it. It can be perceived by touch, sight, hearing, taste, or smell, and it can be moved in various ways. He also says, Well then, what am I? A thing that thinks. What is that? A thing that doubts, understands, affirms, denies, wants, refuses, and also imagines and senses. 
So this is what you often hear defined as extended and not extended substances. Bodies that are substance which extends into space, souls are substance which is unextended, capable of remaining even without a body. The eye also has the ability to make judgments over bodies, being able to recognize things even as their appearances change. We heat the wax over the stove, for instance, and even though the wax changes its properties when it's melted, uh, it's a different color, it's a different smell, it's a different shape, it's a different state, etc. The mind can still understand these two seemingly contradictory bodies as the same wax. This is where we really find the first modern description of substances. On one side, material substance. On the other side, ideal substance. Uh, substance of bodies, substance of minds. It's important to note that this means that Descartes was neither a materialist nor an idealist in the strict sense. He was instead a dualist. He asserted the existence of two independent substances. Hegel was an idealist. He thought there was only one substance, that being thought. Marx was a materialist. He thought that all substance was, was matter. Materialism and idealism are monist philosophies, meaning they believe in a singular substance. Not every monist is a materialist or an idealist either. Spinoza thought there was only one infinite substance, that being God, who has an infinite number of attributes. Two of those attributes are thought and extension. But we're getting way into the weeds here. You can see how quickly this starts to get into minutia when you start going philosopher by philosopher. I think the important thing to take away is that materialism and idealism, in their broadest philosophical sense, don't imply things like determinism or free will, or realism or non-realism, only what the underlying metaphysical substance really is. Whatever it means to live in a material or ideal world, such as if it's determinate, if it's real, that all varies depending on whichever philosopher you are actually talking about. So why did people so quickly start talking about materialism and idealism when the whole thing started with dualism? Well, dualism has its problems. Stepping back into Descartes, we saw there were two unique substances of a totally different kind, totally separate. So the question is raised, how does one affect the other, and vice versa? How is it that something non-material is supposed to affect the material, and how is something material supposed to create something non-material? This is often called the explanatory gap, the fact that there appears to be no mechanism linking the physical to the ideal. Descartes smooths over the interaction problem by introducing the idea of a perfect god. A perfect and benevolent god wouldn't lie to us, and therefore we have the ability to trust in the interaction we experience between mind and matter, because we can assume with some confidence that god would tell us the truth. The fact the interaction problem seemed so vast that you needed something like God to bridge it, it's one of the reasons monism, mainly materialism and idealism, have come to dominate the discussion of substance since Descartes. But this isn't even the only roadblock for dualism. As science has advanced, it has only made this problem more complicated. Sorry to everyone out there preemptively gnashing their teeth about how science solves all this stuff. Science is obviously defaulted as a materialist position, but we can already see a bit of a problem as there are a whole bunch of non-material things now embraced by modern science. This has led to some people referring to the term physicalism uh, rather than materialism, although materialism, it's really, it's interchangeable with physicalism. A materialist and a physicalist, they tend to agree on most things. You, you won't find very many materialists who don't believe in the non-material laws of physics. This weird pseudo-divide between materialism and physicalism does point to something interesting, though. That the distinction between materialism and idealism, it's no longer a matter of extended or non-extended substance, but it's been almost unconsciously uh, restated as a debate on whether every particular phenomena can be accurately described by the laws of physics. This is summed up in Hempel's Dilemma, which points to these new, strange, circular definitions of physical and non-physical that we tend to assume these days. But, you see, you can't ask the question about a, a interaction between physical and non-physical until you tell us what physical means. Okay, you've at least got to be able to tell us what physical means in order for the question to be answered. But there hasn't been any concept of physical for hundreds of years. Um, there was one in the early scientific revolution, a very intuitive concept of the physical. 
That's what inspired Galileo, Descartes, Leibniz, Newton, Lagrange, you know, many others all throughout the modern history of science. But it's been recognized, but it was already recognized after Newton that it's gone. Like Locke recognized it, Hume recognized it. Uh, for Hume, it's not only gone, it's a total mystery beyond our intellectual capacities. And uh, that we can speculate about, but it's certainly gone. And no one has proposed anything else. The physical these days are things that Newton would have regarded as total absurdities, like curved space-time. How can that be physical? Uh, quantum entanglement. I mean, Einstein regarded that as non-physical because it's so absurd. Uh, but you know, now scientists just accept it. Uh, physical is just anything we more or less understand. And if that's the, the the only notion of physical we have, there can't be uh, interaction between physical and non-physical. Non-physical will be all the things, just all the things we don't understand. If we ever get to understand them, they'll be physical. <laughs> so where did philosophy go from here? Where are we now? Unfortunately, by some accounts, it appears we're even further from an answer as we were in the first place. As science has finally approached the point of understanding the brain, we were able to do scans and tests and whatnot to really find out where those thoughts, that non-extended substance, you know, where it was, where, how it was able to interact with the brain. And what did they find? Nothing. Yes, there are electrical signals, chemicals, neurons, all that kind of stuff, but they never found a thought. At first it was assumed that, you know, particular thoughts might be identical with certain brain states. For example, the color blue would be identical to a certain section of the brain firing. This was not the case, however, and in fact we found that the brain has an incredible level of plasticity. Structures of the brain can be vastly reorganized, even redistributed. If a certain part of the brain is damaged in the stroke, other areas of the brain have been shown to actually begin picking up that processing for the damaged portion. The color section of your brain might start to be processed by another section, for instance. Then you have people like Thomas Nagel, who presents an incredibly influential paper on the epistemological issues raised by these conclusions of neuroscience. He calls it, what is it like to be a bat? And in this paper, he asks a pretty straightforward question. Can it be said that the physical states of the brain are identical to the thoughts we experience? Setting aside scientific issues for a moment, consider a thought experiment. If there were a scientist who were able to study uh, the brain of a bat and come to 100% understanding, it understands everything about that bat's brain, how the brain states work, how the neurons fire, how they lead to the thoughts that arise, etc. Would a scientist ever be able to know what it's like to actually be a bat? Where, in the study of bat neurons, do you come to understand the subjective quality of something like echolocation? Could this scientist gain this knowledge from brain science? Nagel argues no. There is something experiential lost in scientific reductionism. There isn't one-to-one -one knowledge parity between brain states and the experience created by those brain states. We might be able to look at a brain scan and say, this subject is seeing something red. But we could not say what this experience of redness looks like to the subject, just as the bat scientist could tell that a bat was echolocating, but not what that experience of echolocating actually feels like to that bat. He says, Our own experience provides the basic material for our imagination, whose range is therefore limited. It will not help to try to imagine that one has webbing on one's arms, which enables one to fly around at dusk and dawn, catching insects in one's mouth. That one has very poor vision, and perceives the surrounding world by a system of reflected high-frequency sound signals, and that one spends the day hanging upside down by one's feet in an attic. Insofar as I can imagine this, which is not very far, it tells me only what it would be like for me to behave as a bat behaves. But that is not the question. I want to know what it is like for a bat to be a bat. Yet, if I try to imagine this, I am restricted to the resources of my own mind, and those resources are inadequate to the task. I cannot perform it either by imagining additions to some present experience, or by imagining segments gradually subtracted from it, or by imagining some combination of additions, subtractions, and modifications. 
if we acknowledge that a physical theory of mind must account for the subjective character of experience, we must admit that presently no conception gives us a clue on how this could be done. The problem is unique. If mental processes are indeed physical processes, then there is something that it is like, intrinsically, to undergo certain physical processes. What it is for such a thing to be the case remains a mystery. Nagel here is a skeptic. He doesn't conclude that therefore materialism is false, or therefore the study of the brain cannot lead to a deeper understanding or even total understanding of subjective experience, rather that the current paradigms of science are simply not in a position to reach these answers. Should there be some Copernican-style revolution in neuroscience, perhaps the mysteries of the interaction problem will be unlocked. But until then, we must resist drawing conclusions here. It's outside of our realm of judgment. David Chalmers attacks us from another angle. There are two issues. First, how does the brain work like it does? Like, how does it work in a material fashion? How do neurons fire? What do the chemical releases do, etc.? Second, why does the brain function in a subjective fashion? Why do we feel pain or have an experience of redness? The first problem, the problem of how, is called the easy problem of consciousness. The second problem, the problem of why, is called the hard problem of consciousness. This is a very important formulation for modern philosophy, contemporary philosophy. The crux of materialism and idealism today quite often boils down to debates over this hard problem. If the brain works materially, why are there non-material thoughts in the first place? If the brain can know it's seeing red by the nature of neurons firing, why have a corresponding feeling of redness at all? It's quite easy to imagine someone whose brain fires the way everyone else's does. They react the proper way to every bit of stimuli they interact, but at the same time they actually have no conscious awareness of everything. If you ask them how they are feeling, they say good, but there is no actual experience of good being had, only the brain states firing which would lead them to say they feel good. Because they would act behaviorally in the same way as any other person would, and their brain would fire in the same material way as everybody else's, there really would be no way, scientifically, to determine if such a subject exists. Descartes talks this way of animals, actually. As autonomous, uh, they appear to, for instance, feel pain, but they lack a soul, thus a subject. They can be experimented on, even torturously when alive, because their cries of pain are simply the result of mechanics, not a subject feeling and experiencing that pain. There's nothing wrong with it, no more than there would be taking apart a clock, even though it you know, starts ringing when you do so. We call this idea of a non-subjective agent a philosophical zombie. If you look at the brain from the outside, you see this extraordinary machine, um, an organ consisting of 84 billion neurons that fire in synchrony with each other. When I see visual inputs come to my eyes, photons hit my eyes, they send a signal that goes up the optic nerve to the back of my brain. It sends neural firings propagating throughout my brain, and eventually I might produce an action. From the outside, though, I look like a complicated mechanism, a robot. This is how science might describe me from the objective point of view. But there's also a subjective point of view. There's what it feels like for the agent who is seeing the scene. One of the most familiar facts in the world that we have this subjective experience, but it's also one of the most mysterious. Why is it that these physical processes in the brain should produce subjective experience. Why doesn't it go on in the dark without any consciousness at all? No one right now knows the answer to this question. Chalmers calls himself a naturalistic dualist, meaning that he feels that mental states are caused by physical brain states, but they are nonetheless not reducible to one another. This means that thoughts are not the same substance as physical things, even though that substance may arise from them. Daniel Dennett is still a monist, a strict materialist, and he has taken the root of what is called scientific reductionism. This implies that everything about mental states can be described by a thorough scientific account of brain states as we have it today. Since neuroscience hasn't found thoughts anywhere, Dennett concludes that those thoughts simply don't exist, at least not in the way we understand them. 
If there is some form of thought, it is totally epiphenomenal, or non-causal. The feeling of redness is in fact simply an illusion of redness. Redness itself doesn't actually exist. There is the physical brain state corresponding to red, and the physical brain state causes the illusion of redness as an epiphenomenon, or a phenomena happening alongside a phenomena but which does not affect it. A basic example here, you put your hand on a stove, you feel pain, so you move your hand. Dennett would say this is a psychological account which has been disproven by science. You put your hand on a stove and a brain state corresponding to pain was made in the brain which makes you move your hand. At the same time as this, there is an illusory feeling of pain which you believe that you feel, but really this feeling of pain has no influence over the brain state corresponding to pain. Your subjective feeling of pain literally has nothing to do with the fact that you moved your hand, and the fact that you think it did is basically just your brain inventing an elaborate fiction for you. All you understand to be free choice is simply your brain fooling you into thinking you actually made a choice after your brain had already done so. Because there are, of course, in fact, representations of colors and shapes and motions and sounds on the DVD disc. Not actual sounds and not actual colors. Now, I submit that if you think there's a hard problem, you're making an analogous naive error about consciousness. It is, I know, that's offensive. <laughs> but. Get used to it, <laughs> because this is going to be what I'm going to try to show you, is that if you've been taken in by the hard problem, you are committing, you're, you're being gullible. You're, you're failing to see some fundamental possibilities that are simply being swept out of your view. This is what you're inclined to think. This is the hard problem. There must be qualia in there causing our appreciation and our beliefs and our behaviors. They just have to be. No, they don't. There are representations of colors and shapes, motion, sounds, in the medium of neural spike trains or action potentials in the brain. That's how the brain represents. Not with lands and pits, not bit strings, but with neural signals. We don't know exactly what the format is, but that's how the brain represents information. And that's all there is to it. But there seems to be an inner multimedia theater where the consciousness happens. David said this much. And I agree, there seems to be. But there isn't. <laughs> there isn't. There just seems to be. I agree that there seems to be. But I don't believe that there is. A big issue arises here though, what possible use could this illusion serve? If the brain were to function in the same way without the illusion, if you don't need an experience of pain to move your hand away from the stove, why is there an experience in the first place? Why make the illusion? There could be no evolutionary basis to this illusion, as again, it's epiphenomenal. It has no causal effect over whatever behavior we actually perform whatever behavior evolution would show to be most fit. There would be no reason for evolution to select for those things which create this elaborate illusion over those things which don't. It has no benefit, and in fact it would make much more sense, causally, for us to have evolved as a philosophical zombie, with no epiphenomenal illusion of mental states whatsoever. Okay, so what does this teach us? Well, for one, we don't know what's going on. We literally are no closer to having a unified theory of substance than the ancient Greeks were. Science hasn't provided clear answers, and the answers they have provided still leave huge logical stumbling blocks to our understanding. Materialism and idealism as terms, they're virtually meaningless without a very detailed account of what you actually mean by them. How they function ontologically and epistemologically, and how they overcome those various gaps. How they face up to the current understandings of neuroscience. What is the interactive status between mental states? Are they caused? Are they causal? Are they phenomenal? Are they epiphenomenal? Etc. And it's not like we have even scratched the surface here. There are literally dozens of alternative propositions that I haven't even mentioned. Things like property dualism, 
predicate dualism, bundle dualism, super heliomorphic dualism, minimalism, pluralism, functionalism, realist idealism, totally realism, type absolute cosmos, a priori, idealism, ontological phenomenalism. So I guess what I'm trying to say is, at least in general, when people talk about substance, when we use words like materialism and idealism, we really have no fucking clue what we're talking about. And your name. What the fuck is your name? Please.